Thank you for attending the third of four uh, programs on the commercial division in the New York State Supreme Court. Today's program is on electronic discovery. Our speakers are Lynn Nooner, Linton Mann III, and Rachel Sparks Bradley. They're all partners at Simpson Thatcher and they're all litigators, primarily in financial matters, such as securities fraud, 10B5 matters, but also arbitrations and hearings, um, some before the National Advertising Division of the BBB, which we'll have to talk about sometime, Lynn. Um, their clients include TD Bank, Weight Watchers, and Great Wolf Resorts, to name but a few. So these highly credentialed attorneys, too many credentials and awards and so forth to list here, are joined by my colleague here at 60 Center Street in the commercial division, Joel Cohen. Prior to his judicial career, uh, Judge Cohen was a partner at Davis Polk. I'm Justice Andrea Maisley, and it's my privilege to introduce the panel today. Uh, before we get to their discussion, I'd like to remind you about the commercial division, where I am one of 27 judges in the state of New York assigned to work in the commercial division. For more information about the commercial division, I urge you to take a look at the commercial division advisory council's video, which I believe Lynn was responsible for or had a hand in. Um, and it's on the commercial division's website, newyorkcourts.gov. I hope you'll think about joining us as an intern or a law clerk. The law clerk positions are regularly advertised um, on the court's website. Um, and you'll find information about um, open positions on our web pages as well, the individual judges. So to contact the judges or look for an opening, um, look at our web pages where you'll find our rules and practices and open positions. Um, look at um, you can also look at nycourts.gov. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for a discussion of uh, electronic discovery, um, a, car a crucial part of the litigation process. And I hope to see you on June 27th for a discussion of trials. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Maisley. Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Nooner. I have the privilege of doing a short intro for each of my co-presenters. We are really thrilled here at Simpson Thatcher to be co-presenting with Justice Cohen, who has been on the commercial division bench since the beginning of 2019. Justice Cohen had quite a storied career across the street from us at Davis Polk and Wardwell as a esteemed litigation partner there. He was an associate there. He was a full career Davis Polk litigator. And before that had a clerkship on the 11th circuit for a judge clerk. We are really delighted to be presenting our segment today on discovery with him. You'll hear from Justice Cohn first, and then each of Linton, Rachel, and I will be asking Justice Cohn for comments on our sections. After Justice Cohn gives the opening remarks, we'll move first to Linton Mann, our partner who has too many accolades really to recite to you, but he's on every 40 under 40 hot list going. He is um, a rising star for Euro money and the next generation partners for the legal 500 in the rising star category from the New York Journal and 40 and under list for benchmark. Linton, in addition to be a fan, being a fantastic all around litigator, uh, security suits, derivative suits, commercial disputes. He also has a very strong hand in pro bono work. He's director of the Manhattan Legal Services Program and is quite involved with charter schools in our city. He has three children who he is putting through those schools. Uh, Rachel Sparks Bradley hails from the Pacific Northwest. She's been at Simpson her entire career. Our partner is a very well-regarded securities litigator, but she is also in the commercial division all the time and knows her way around the courts very strongly. She also has quite a few accolades, including in the pro bono field, being recognized by Sanctuary for Families for her going above and beyond for a pro bono human achievement awards. So Linton will be speaking about interrogatories, document requests, and one of his favorite topics, ESI. Rachel will deal with motions to compel and privilege logs. I'll close us out with respect to depositions and experts. 
But before we get to those, we'd very much like to turn the podium over to Justice Cohn and let him give the introductory remarks on the commercial division and the role of discovery in our litigation. Thank you, Justice Cohn. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, well, good to be with you all. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, a terrific lecture series, having really some of the best lawyers in the country um, uh, giving you all an overview of some of the basic issues. I, I think it's a terrific part of the summer, so I, I really appreciate them um, donating uh, their valuable time. Uh, one, uh, I'll try to be brief with this intro. The uh, I think one unique thing we have, and I, I know some other court systems have something similar, but at least in my experience, that the Commercial Division Advisory Council um, and the commercial division itself, including the discovery rules, is, is really one of the best public-private um, partnerships that I'm aware of. Um, it's, uh, in fact, frankly, I didn't fully appreciate it until I, until I got here. Um, basically having a, a, an exceptional group of mostly lawyers, there are you know, a, a few judges on it, several judges, including Judge Maisley. Um, but it, it is a, a direct working relationship to come up with uh, rules that make sense, that are work for both the bench and the bar, and really without uh, very much red tape at all. The, the, the process of getting from an idea to a rule that actually goes all the way through and gets on the books, uh, in my opinion, is remarkably fast. Uh, it may seem slow to the people involved in it, but um, it's a very uh, feedback sensitive uh, operation so that I think that our rules, which really uniquely are um, crafted by lawyers and judges working together uh, is really quite an amazing thing. Um, and I think each time there's a new development in terms of technology, uh, or you know, even the, the pandemic, it's translated into timely and really uh, well thought out rules. And then you know, periodically, even when we see a rule in progress and in process and then in operation, if we on the judicial side see a couple of tweaks that might be helpful, you know, in many systems you have to go back up through the legislature and around for years. And um, we had one recently where it was really very rapid. And so I think it's a tremendous uh, partnership. And uh, as a, the result of it is, is that you have a set of a court with rules that are uh, in which the, the bar is, is very much invested and is a living, breathing organism. So um, I, think it, um, I think NYC Broadway just went live. So. Um, but moving on to just briefly what we're going to talk about today, this is sort of the blocking and tackling uh, of the litigation process. So again, having this panel go through some of the basics, I think, is extremely uh, helpful. Um, if we can just skip down to the next slide. The, uh, the rules, which I'm not going to go through in any detail because I want to get to it, uh, are designed to start structuring a case right from the beginning. The preliminary conference, working out the, the uh, uh, parameters of discovery, highlighting issues early on, trying to talk about um, possibilities for dispute resolution and the like, um, but really flagging things as early as possible, I think is, is one of the, uh, it's not unique to our court, but I think it's, it's an important part of the, the rules here. If we can go to the next one. Um, the, uh, we try to set out the disclosure schedule. Disclosure is the traditional word in New York practice. People still call it discovery, which is the, uh, the federal word. I, I'll use discovery here. Um, and uh, we try to set those out at the beginning, map it out as best as possible, but then constantly are having conferences to um, tweak it here and there to uh, adapt to the circumstances of the case. It's important from the court's perspective to keep a, a close eye on things to make sure things don't stretch out. Uh, you know, each delay at the beginning, 
extrapolates and, 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 and just expands. So we try to keep a close eye on things. Um, but we do set a schedule early um, and moving on. Um, we'll get to this later. The, <laughs> some of my favorite parts of the rules are what it limits um, because I think for those of you in law school now, the, you know, the history of discovery has waxed and waned and first it's expanded and then it contracts. Uh, I think one of the really terrific things that our rules do, again, driven by the Commercial Division Advisory Council, is they really focused on limiting what's a waste of time uh, and focused on what's more important. And um, we'll, get to, we'll get to it later, but the limits on interrogatories are my personal favorite. Um, and uh, I'll get to a little bit more about why that might be. Um, but the, the, the rules are designed to be as efficient as we can be. The courts are very supportive of getting through the discovery process as quickly as we can. And uh, you'll probably hear this, but the focus on proportionality because discovery can, as we all know, get out of hand. And, uh, you know, broadly written, you could ask for billions of uh, pieces of data, but you don't really need that. So um, limits and expansions, we'll get into the important uh, pieces about electronic discovery shortly, but that's the kind of things that I think the commercial division, at least in my view, uh, is one of the modern drivers of, of practice in keeping discovery effective but trying to keep it within reasonable bounds. So um, I think that, am I passing it on to Linton now? Thank yes, you so thank much, you. Justice Cohen. I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, I have the privilege of walking you all through what I think is uh, among the most, if not the most important parts of a litigation. And that's uh, sort of the documents, the information, what we're actually gonna be litigating about in any trial and asking witnesses about in any depositions. And so we'll talk a little bit about the written discovery um, and how we seek that information and how we end up producing it to the other, other sides. And then we'll talk specifically about electronically stored information or ESI as you might hear about it, because that's literally how things are. That, that's where the information is today. It's, it's trapped in emails and text messages and uh, collaborative uh, software. And we're going to talk about how we go about obtaining that information, uh, producing that information, and ultimately using it in, in a litigation. So as Justice Cohen uh, alluded to, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is interrogatories. And these are the written questions that parties can send to each other. Um, you'll receive interrogatories, you'll investigate them, and then you have to respond under oath as to uh, the answer to these questions. And um, in, in some ways, they're incredibly helpful, right? Um, in, in the search for information, the search for truth, you can look at a ton of documents, you can ask witnesses all sorts of questions, uh, but sometimes having the ability to just write a question to your adversary and say, you know, here, what, what is your contention about something? Um, the thought was, okay, great, we'll write that question, they'll respond, and we'll all have more information. Um, but as any seasoned practitioner can tell you, what it ended up being was a really smart lawyer wrote a very good question, um, an equally smart lawyer wrote three pages of an answer that said nothing, uh, or as little as humanly possible. Uh, and so, Looking at the commercial division's uh, sort of emphasis on efficiency and productivity, thought, well, how about let's target this, right? At least at the beginning of the case, let's have interrogatories. They're limited in number, and they're focused on those issues that everybody ought to be focused on at the beginning. Who are the witnesses with knowledge and information necessary to the action? right? Where is this information? Is it in the custody of one of the parties? Uh, is there a third party who has this information so that everyone knows that that's where we all have to go? But targeted at that, uh, that universe of information, are there damages, right? The plaintiff complaint of damages in their complaint, uh, if it's unclear as to how those damages are uh, comp uh, computed, Let's ask that in an interrogatory. Again, making sure everybody's on the same page about these critical issues right at the beginning of the case. And then if you wanna go beyond that, 
that's when you either have to consent among the parties um, or go to the court and ask and show good cause for why an additional interrogatory uh, would be necessary and why an interrogatory would be the best vehicle for getting at that additional information. Um, and I'll give you a, a um, an example there, you know, sometimes you're dealing in a litigation with issues that occurred many, many years prior, right? And despite uh, document holds and document productions, maybe the information exists in the minds of people who are no longer at the company or no longer employed by the defendant. And someone says, okay, well, let's have a corporate deposition. Let's let's ask the, the company uh, uh, or a lot of witnesses um, because we have to get the answers to these questions. Well, the parties might agree that why don't you just put your questions in writing? We'll do the work. We will investigate the facts and then we can give you a written response, the same written response I would use to prepare a witness to testify on those issues. So again, it's just efficiency in the sake of efficiency. Let's just do this by written interrogatory. That's, that's a way that the parties can consent where it all makes sense. Um, and if not, then we go to the, to the court and, and see if uh, um, the court can give us more guidance. Before I move on, I, I think, uh, Justice Cohen, interrogatories were particular to you and your mind <laughs> and your feeling. I wanted to give you an opportunity to say anything else you wanted to before we move on to document requests. I, I think you covered it very well. I, I think the only disputes anymore that I see about interrogatories are from people who haven't read the rules um, and who you know, send off a, just a wave of, of the very creative questions that you talked about. And, and uh, I, I think the, um, uh, I, I think one of the best rules we have is it just kind of avoids this sort of needless uh, back and forth with which doesn't usually lead to anything. And at the end of it, you just do the depositions anyway. So now I, I think that if you follow the rules and you ask what you're supposed to, and, and the one thing we do have is contention interrogatories, which are more interesting questions, which uh, we permit, but only after sort of at the back part of the process. You know, so a lot of times people would, you know, flood them at the beginning and people weren't ready for it and you'd end up with all this meaningless, you know, jabbering back and forth. But no, I think you've roasted interrogatories quite well. That's great. And um, you, you'll hear a theme about this uh, through electronic discovery. That's a theme of timing right, when these questions are being asked, when the parties are in the best position to answer uh, these questions. And, and we'll talk about that as we talk about the different discovery devices. Um, the next that we're gonna talk about for a moment are document requests. Um, and these are literally the document you will serve on the other side and say, please produce all documents relating to X, right? And the, the various categories of information that you think are necessary to understand uh, and substantiate the claims and the defenses in the case. Uh, and we, we put there that you have two choices when you receive document requests. You can produce the documents that were requested, or you can object. And in reality, 99 times out of 100, you're going to do a little bit of both, right? You're going to uh, assert an objection about the, the category of documents that were requested, if it was, if it was vague, um, if it wasn't clear as to time period, if um, you think it's it's asking for too much, you know, if it's overbroad, uh, you will object on, on those grounds and then subject to those objections say, this is what we will produce. So it's clear to everyone what it is that you're withholding, if anything, and what it is that you are agreeing to produce. And the parties can then discuss those, negotiate those, and at the end of the day, everybody understands uh, this is the set of documents that we're going to go out there and look for and ultimately produce. Um, and so when you receive those um, objections, when you receive the document request, you want to be thinking about um, how am I going to reply to them? Am I going to say we will produce everything or are there parts of the questions uh, that are problematic that you want to object to? Um, same thing, when you receive those objections, you want to make sure and, and really nail down, is anything actually being withheld here? Yes, they made all of these objections, but are they still giving us everything or are they really withholding something? And that's what you want to nail down because if they're withholding something, that would be the basis of a dispute that you might have to bring to the court's attention. And I know Rachel's going to tell you about how, how to do that, but the, the key thing I would advise all of you is if you are you know, putting these together for the first time, you really uh, be wary of using models from too long ago. 
right? It wasn't too long ago where, you know, you have pages and pages of objections, sure, subject to those, we'll, we'll produce. Courts have gotten much, much uh, wearier about just blanket objecting to things. They really just want to see what are you withholding, if anything, and what's the basis of that, right? That's the dispute that's, that's before the parties and, and ultimately potentially before the court. So keeping it clear, keeping it clean, that's what's going to make it much more presentable and palatable to a court if you end up having to fight this, um, but also just clear to everyone as to what's going on. In terms of timing, um, as you can imagine, uh, we want all the documents, if possible, to be produced prior to depositions, right? But when you have a witness there, they're testifying about our questions about the documents that have been produced and, and their understanding of the case. Well, if they testify in a deposition and then the party goes on and produces a, a lot more documents about them, um, then somebody's going to ask them to come back and sit again, and it just creates, you know, a lot of a lot of additional room for argument. And so again, keeping with trying to keep it as efficient as possible. Uh, ideally, the timeline for producing documents is gonna be before um, the start of depositions. And it's an iterative process, right? You're gonna send document requests at the very, very beginning of the case when your understanding is probably a bit more limited. And as you grow and understand and learn more as the case progresses, you'll probably supplement with additional document requests. Um, and so there we asked, that all of the receiving party is responsible for letting uh, the party who's sending the document request know um, no later than a month prior to the close of fact discovery that I don't control the documents you're looking for. If the documents you're looking for are actually held by a third party, someone else, um, we've got to let them know that so they have time within the fact discovery schedule to go out and try to get those documents from someone else. Uh, again, making sure that, as Justice Cole mentioned earlier, that timeline doesn't begin to shift, right? You've got those deadlines that were set in the pretrial pre pre order. You want to make sure those continue to stay consistent. So follow those deadlines when you are considering um, your document requests and responses. Now, we're going to get to what we mean by electronically um, stored information, but at, the, at its bottom, this is how information is, is maintained today. You all know this. Um, the volume of information that is created has exploded, uh, given uh, the number of emails that are out there, like I said, text messages, other ways that we all communicate electronically. So it's critical at the very, very beginning of the case that the parties meet and they discuss, how are we going to get our arms around this? What is really, really needed to answer the questions presented by this case? Um, what has to be preserved for, for the future? Who has this information, the, the custodians? And what's the most efficient and effective method for us to go out there and collect this information, search it, and ultimately produce it to the other side? Um, the courts really aren't equipped to understand all of the different types of technology that are used by every you know, corporate party in the world. So it's incumbent upon the parties to train ourselves, right? Interview your clients, understand how they use documents, how they uh, store information, and then have those conversations with the other side for us to really figure out to the best we can, again, what's the appropriate scope of the discovery in this particular case. Um, these rules and this uh, requirement that we negotiate with one another applies to both parties and non-parties. Um, but importantly, uh, in, at least in New York, in the commercial division, if you're asking a non-party to produce a lot of information, um, you may be forced to defray their cost. And, and that's a, a very um, humbling conversation to have and, and, and can uh, sort of focus the party's energies on what really is required for this particular matter. So you want to have those conversations prior to preliminary conference, right? So if you do hit a wall and, and people can't agree on uh, what the appropriate scope is or, or what the appropriate categories of documents, then you know that that can be brought up before the court at the preliminary conference and the court can give you guidance. Um, you know, if you're representing defendants, I tell people all the time in my practice, the best thing I've done and the thing that I think has impacted me before judges when I had to argue these issues is I proactively produce the things that I know have to go out the door, right? They are critical. They are understanding. It does go to the merits of the case. There's no argument or objection that's going to keep these documents in. So I produce them. And it's, it's the critical key information. And having done that, 
whenever we are then later arguing before the court about something, I can say, Your Honor, they already have X, Y, and Z. They already have the critical information. They already have the information from the key custodians. What they're asking for now is a fishing expedition. That argument is much more persuasive um, if you actually, if it doesn't appear that you're just stonewalling and trying to give them nothing at all. So just think about that. Every case is different and you got to um, um, look at it uh, in, in a unique manner. Uh, but think about when these issues are coming before the court and how best you can present and look to the court as someone who's trying to move the ball forward and not just, you know, blocking and tackling and, and wasting the court's time. Yeah, I, I think that that's it's a great point that um, we're constantly, I, I think, looking for who's trying to solve problems and who's creating them. And it's something that uh, you build up over the course of time and you build up credibility across cases. And I, I think Linton is exactly right that um, you want to put yourself in that position so that you can legitimately say that you're being the cooperating party, we're not being the, the roadblock. Um, and, and sometimes uh, strategic retreats, you know, saying, all right, well, we'll do this. We've done too much already, but we'll do this. Put you in a, in a very good position to argue for what really matters. So I, I think that's a very good approach. And in terms of costs and burden, right, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? Uh, because all the, the quantum of, of emails and electronic information that's out there can be quite significant. And if you had to look at every single word of every single document, that could be incredibly costly. And so getting your arms around um, what is the universe of documents and what is truly necessary uh, and proportional is the word that you'll hear all the time. Right, we're, we're out of the days of everything that is um, that could lead to relevant information must be produced. It's about proportionality, uh, and the key uh, issues that you're dealing with there are what's the nature of the dispute, the amount in controversy, how important is the requested material to the ultimate disposition of the case, um, and that's a great way of saying no two cases are the same. And it's very hard to write, um, you know, categorical rules that's going to that's going to govern this. So proportionality is a tool um, in every litigator's tool bag that you ought to be thinking about when you are deciding how much is too much. And, and again, um, that changes as the case progresses. Right, the more and more you produce, um, the, perhaps the stronger of an argument you have that whatever else that they're asking for now, this isn't about turning over every rock. They've got what they need to move this case forward, um, and, and you can have uh, have that discussion. Uh, we talked a little bit about the financial burden, right, and how that can be alleviated with the tools that courts have um, to hear the, the other side out and say, okay, sounds like you really want this information. They've put the, the producing side has put together a very persuasive presentation as to why it may not be proportional. So I'll grant you the request. I'll make them do this, but you're going to have to defray their costs. You're going to have to, you know, um, uh, help alleviate some of that burden that, that the producing party represented. Because at the end of the day, the courts are looking for the fair, reasonable, and cost-effective ESI discovery um, as, as we are all looking towards uh, the search for the, for the truth. But now we're going to talk just quickly about what do we mean when we say technology-assisted review? Because it can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And, and this is where, uh, again, you see uh, a case that is right at the jurisdictional threshold uh, for the commercial division, that case might not require all the bells and whistles that are available um, for uh, technology assistant review. Um, whereas a case that is a, a multi-billion dollar case, it's got uh, a, a nationwide scope in terms of where the information might be, uh, that case probably does require, you know, using all of technology to figure out how we can do this in, a, in the most cost-effective way. And so the commercial division is one of the first courts to adopt a specific rule that encourages parties to consider using the appropriate technology assisted review in their cases. But what that means in different cases will mean different things. So practically, um, all of you, or, you know, probably all of you have grown up in the Google age. You've been using very sophisticated search tools to narrow, you know, mountains of information before. So you're, you're quite familiar with this. Um, but in the legal world, 
I, I'd say for most cases, you know, searching documents, running, you know, keyword searches across documents used by pretty much everybody, right? Um, that just makes sense to, again, lower the number of documents that a human being is going to have to lay eyes on and see, is that relevant? Does that need to be produced? Um, but as the quantum of damages gets higher, then additional um, tools are, are uh, need to be considered for appropriateness. You've got concept searching where documents are, uh, a computer will analyze all the text in a document and put the documents that relate to various concepts together. So a reviewer can review all of those documents about a particular concept at one time and hopefully do that in a more efficient manager than had those documents been spread out across hundreds, if not thousands or millions. Email threading, right? Every single time you send an email, even if there are 15 different replies, each of those is a single document, uh, according to most document management systems. Um, so email threading says, actually, we don't need to look at and have produced 15 different times each individual portion of that email chain, just produce the last one, right? That has all the information, produce that one time, and you've gotten rid of 15 documents that someone has to take a look at. Um, near dupe identification, uh, you'll hear that's where all the documents that are very, very similar to each other are put together, and you can look at them. Um, and it, this really helps in, in two ways. One, uh, it shows you that these documents are very, very similar, so hopefully you can re review them that much quicker. But it's also telling you these documents are similar, but they're not duplicates. There's something different about each of these documents. And so it zeroes you in on trying to figure out, well, what is that difference? And does that impact? Is it relevant or not? Is it privileged or not? So again, you can speed through that prediction. And finally, and, and I think what we all get to play with most often in our cases are what we call predictive coding or continuous active learning. And these are, um, this is, these are tools that allow the computer to analyze the information and make a prediction that I think this document is worthy of your review. It's not saying, I think you ought to produce this document or I think this document is privileged. It's saying based on what you've told us in the past about what matters in this case, I think this document is worthy of your review. And you'll review it and you'll say, this is responsive, this is privileged or not. And the computer will constantly look at what you're doing, constantly train itself, retrain itself, and constantly re-review all the other documents you haven't looked at and only elevate those that make sense for you to review. And you do that pretty quickly. And ultimately you get to a point where the computer will say, I've looked at this other million documents that you have left out of your total universe. And out of that, I don't think there's anything here that's worthy of you to review based on how you've reviewed the prior documents. And then you know, okay, great. I don't need a human being to look at that million documents. Let me call my adversary and say, this is where we are. We reviewed it. We produced it. You've got the stuff. The computer's telling me none of that needs to be looked at. Um, and you can have conversations about, are you going to run terms over that or, or, you know, figure out what it's going to take for your adversary to get comfortable. But at the end of the day, you can say stop far earlier than we would have done before. So you're really uh, entering the legal profession at one of the most exciting times to be a junior litigator in this world, because things that we would have had a human being look at and spend weeks, if not months, in some cases, years going through, you don't have to do that at all because technology has caught up to fix the problem it created when we had this explosion of information. Um, and so those are some of the concepts, some of the uh, technology assistant review methods that you'll hear about and that are encouraged uh, by the commercial division for parties to think about and apply to their cases. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, my dear friend, Rachel, who will talk about what happens when those negotiations break down and we do need to go to Justice Cohen and ask for help. Great, thanks, Linton. Uh, so hi, everybody. Um, I get to talk to you about motions to compel and privilege logs, which I know are the topics you've been sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for. Um, the, the first thing I'll say just before we dive into motions to compel is 
you know, as Linton has indicated, and I think some of Justice Cohen's comments have gone to as well, discovery is really a collaborative process between the plaintiffs and the defendants. You're constantly talking to your adversary, negotiating search terms, negotiating who the document custodians are going to be, what particular people. You might be negotiating, you know, whose deposition is going to be taken, the date for that deposition, where it will be located, is it convenient for everybody? And the better um, relationship that you have with opposing counsel, the better those those negotiations will go for you. Um, it, it also just makes your professional working life a lot better. So one of the, the best practice tips I can give you is be a decent person, be professional and respectful and treat people um, with, with all courtesy, because it really pays dividends in the end when you're coming to a place where no matter how hard you've tried, you just don't agree on something. And maybe you don't agree on a particular person's deposition, or you don't agree on the scope of what documents are going to be produced. Maybe plaintiffs say they want two years worth of documents and defendants say, well, we only think one year is relevant. And both parties have really strong reasons for believing their positions. So what happens, right? You just, you can't get anywhere no matter how much you've talked about it. So you go to the court and you have to say, look, we've got a dispute. We can't resolve this on our own. We need some help. And the commercial division has procedures in place to allow the parties to resolve that dispute. Now, one thing I'll say is that each justice does have their own rules, as many of you I'm sure already know. So you'll wanna look at those rules specifically, um, but generally speaking, here's how it goes. Um, one of the parties or maybe the parties jointly will send an email or a letter to the court and say, look, we've got this dispute. We, we'd like to talk to the court about it. And then there might be a phone call or a video conference after that where uh, the clerk or the, the justice him or herself will discuss it briefly with the parties. Perhaps it can be resolved there. That's ideal, right? Maybe you just get some direction from the justice about what he or she is thinking, and then that can allow the parties to resolve things. Or maybe the next step is the justice says, you know what? I'd like to see full briefing on this. I'd like to see all the, the parties rationale and then I'll make a decision. So it can go a variety of ways, but the thing to remember is that a motion to compel, to compel documents, to compel deposition testimony, to compel responses to interrogatories, whatever it is, is the last step. You never start there. You, it's, it's only after you've exhausted every, every avenue of trying to agree with the, with the other side that then you go to the court and say, hey, we need some help addressing this. Um, I, and I point out one, go ahead, quick, yes. one quick point about um, maybe a promotional announcement about clerking in the, uh, in the commercial division. I, I, I really can't overstate the importance of the law clerks um, and what they get to do in this process that Rachel's talking about right now. Um, the, uh, I think each, each chambers is probably a little bit different, but, um, my clerks do most of these pre-motion, uh, conferences and in that setting, in terms of professional experience, you are, um, you know, sitting and dealing toe to toe with people like this, you know, the best lawyers in, that there are, and, um, it'll shock you, but they'll listen to you. Um, and, uh, the process, I, I find, I, I mentioned to these guys when we were preparing for this, that um, I get very few actual discovery motions because an enormous percentage of these disputes um, are resolved during these conferences with my clerks. So, you know, you have a, a relatively junior lawyer in some cases dealing with senior partners at Simpson Thatcher and Cravath and whoever. And it's a tremendous professional experience to go through, to get those reps at a very high level, which, you know, as a practical matter, when you're in private practice, it's going to be a while before you're Lynn Nooner. <laughs> um, and um, this is, you know, an acceleration of that process right at the beginning of your career. And, you know, people uh, get a tremendous experience and it's just so valuable uh, for me to have that screening process. So that's my promotional announcement. Perfect, thank you. Um, let's go to the next slide, Linton. So this slide just goes over, um, but I basically just said, but the thing that I'll point out is that um, 
you, you never start with the motion to compel, as I said. It is always after the time to do something has expired or after you've gotten to the point with your adversary where you realize you're not going to be able to reach a resolution. So again, just for, it's never the place you start. Nobody wants to, to be across from the opposing counsel who just files a motion to compel every time there's any kind of disagreement. That's not good for the parties. It's not good for the court. It's not good for anybody. All right, next slide. Um, so a list of things that you'll need um, when you file a motion to compel, you're not going to remember this, even though it's up here on the slide, you're, you're going to you're going to see models when you actually have to do this or when you actually have to adjudicate one of these if you're working for Justice Cohen and resolving um, disputes there. Um, but but all, always is going to come down to an attorney's going to have to say I have a good faith basis for making this motion to compel and the most compelling motions to compel are when an attorney can say I have really tried to resolve this we have the parties we have worked really hard together to resolve this and here is the narrow issue that we cannot resolve and here is court we need you to tell us what we should do so narrow narrow is better um it's all a matter of discretion um, courts have very broad discretion to control discovery, and um, parties can take an immediate appeal of a discovery decision up to the appellate division. The standard there is also discretionary, and in fact, the appellate division can substitute its own discretion for that of the trial court, um, even if it doesn't think that the trial court abused discretion, can just substitute its discretion right on in. Um, the last thing I will say there is um yeah the, the the last note here about sanctions again guys it if if you're acting like a professional a reasonable actor and you are you know trying to do the right thing and act like a responsible litigant this won't be an issue for you so i hope none of you ever have to think about sanctionable issues all right now let's move to privilege logs this is the good stuff um all right so one of the neat things about the commercial division is that it is that there is a preference for what's called a categorical privilege log. Now, I don't know how many of you have had to deal with privilege logs, but at least when I was a junior lawyer, privilege logs were kind of the bane of an associate's existence because they, they're very time intensive to put together. Every document that is privileged has to be logged, like in a huge Excel spreadsheet, to, from, all the information about it, and the reason why it's being withheld on privilege grounds, work product, attorney client communication about attorney advice relating to the transaction at issue or whatever it happens to be. Those can be incredibly valuable tools in depositions or otherwise. But in appropriate cases, the commercial division rules allow parties to use what's called a categorical privilege log. And that means instead of logging every single privilege document individually, you can group them into categories. So let's say you have 10 emails between a client and an attorney, they're all privileged and they all relate to the same subject. You can put all of them in one entry on the categorical on the categorical log instead of logging them separately. Saves time, saves money, um, helps everybody. Now, this type of approach is not the best for every case. It, it really is fact specific, but the rules do provide that this is the commercial division's preference. Um, let's go to the next slide. At least initially. At least, initially. at least initially, right. So sometimes the parties might agree to a categorical log. And then as the matter goes on, realize, you know what? There's more here that we need to know. We need a line by line log. Or one party says to the other party, hey, we need you guys to do a line by line log. We think there's more to all these communications than what we can see on the categorical log. We need the details, the dates, the, the exact times of everything. Um, and there might be a dispute about that. Often there will be because privilege logs are very expensive um, to put together. But if the court were to order um, a, a line by line log, there's also a provision in the rules that allows for fee shifting. So the party requesting the line by line log may have to foot the bill, including the attorney's fees, for the preparation of that log, right? So this is all very fact and case specific, um, but, but, uh, but allows for um variations depending on the facts um let's go to the next slide linton and show the sample of a categorical log so this shows what a categorical log looks like and you can see like there's a date range right uh, three four months can be in a single entry whereas this could be i mean look at that 325 documents withheld that would otherwise be 325 entries now 
maybe you want to know what those entries are and you may have to move for a line by line log, but this might be a good starting place. One other thing the commercial divisions rule the rules do and I'll, I'll end on this is requires that when you do a categorical log a responsible party that is one of the lawyers on the case not a junior lawyer but someone more senior has to provide a certification about the privilege log that they've looked at the documents that they've sampled them themselves that this is not just you know a, a person um, randomly deciding, oh, I'm going to try to hide really damaging documents within this categorical log. You've got someone putting their reputation on the line saying, yes, these documents should be withheld. That's very important um, and an important piece of this. So I'll just end with one question to Justice Cohen. From your years of practicing it at, at Davis Polk and then now as a judge, you know, what is your view of the line by line versus categorical privilege log approach? Well, I think this certainly makes more sense to start this way because, you know, the, the old way, which was everything was document by document, the very first thing you had to do was this unbelievably intensive process that, you know, just absolutely just slaughtered weekends and holidays and, and it was just horrible <laughs> and way more work than was necessary. Be, so I, I, I think that the, the introduction of categorical is a great idea. Um, you know, huge chunks of what used to be done at tremendous expense is now, all right, that's whole category. We're not going to challenge that. Let's move on. And then you just drill down where it's necessary. So I, this is a great example of that public private, you know, pull and, pu pull and push. Um, so I, I think this is another one of my favorite um, uh, initiatives. Perfect. Well, thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Lynn. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. I am going to bring us home with two topics, fact depositions and expert disclosures and depositions. And I am going to ask Linton a favor, which is to take off the slides so that we can let folks see what they really want, which is Justice Cohen in action. There we go. He, I know the the best part of this is hearing from the judge directly. So I'll ask you a few questions as we go along. And I promise I will tell folks what the relevant rules are. So you have them. Fact depositions. The rule you want to look at in the commercial division rules is rule 11D. And it says in our world of restraint and efficiency in the commercial division, there is a presumption that the number of depositions taken in any case is limited on each side to 10 and each deposition will last seven hours. So essentially it should happen in one day. The purpose is to create a reasonable approach to deposition practice. If a party or a case requires additional depositions beyond the 10, you can confer with your adversary if you can't reach an agreement, and then you ask for assistance from your presiding judge the different factors that a judge could take into account if deciding whether to give more than 10 depositions or whether to allow a deposition to last longer than a day is the overall complexity of the case, the number of parties involved, the number of dollars involved, whether there are multiple parties that need to ask questions, whether there are many, many exhibits that would be in play, and the overall level of cooperation among the parties. There is also potentially an opportunity to go to a commercial division judge presiding over your case if in the deposition parties are not getting along to a degree that requires immediate intervention. That should only happen as a matter of last resort. What I will now do is go to Justice Cohn on this mini segment on depositions and say, what has been most compelling to you in terms of ordering extra depositions beyond the rule of 10? And have you ever had any particularly interesting calls from the deposition room where you had to weigh in in real time as the presiding judge? Well, yeah, starting with the, the number of depositions, it, it doesn't really come up that often um, that people will, will abuse it. And, you know, periodically you have to kind of look in and say, well, uh, you know, are you, is it really time to ask for more? Sometimes people will ask for more at the beginning and say, well, in the preliminary conference, I want 30. Well, why don't we see how it goes? And I'll try to, you know, like tease it out because there is that rule that 
gas fills the size of the bottle you built for it, um, you know, however many you give. Um, but, I, you know, I think it, it is a discretion thing. And, and this is one where your dealings with the lawyers through the case will help guide you as to whether these are scorched earth, earth people who are not really thinking about proportionality and saving time and money. Um, but you, you can tell when, you know, 10 is not enough. Um, and you can tell when it is. It's kind of hard to say more than that. Yeah, I mean, you get all sorts of crazy things. People calling you from deposition rooms doesn't happen very often. Um, and you should be prepared for um, not a grouchy judge, but somebody who is kind of like being dragged out of something else. So you better have your, uh, you better be very sharp uh, and it better be very important. But I do think it is, it is helpful sometimes to just resolve something there and then, get it over with and move on. Uh, there is some chance that you don't get the full information. So you have some concern about you know, lurching too quickly. Um, but, but by and large, it's, it's usually a, a topic being blocked off for privilege or a topic being blocked off for being irrelevant or something like that. Um, so I, you know, I, I, you know, whenever a call comes through that says it's an emergency and we, we, we need you to, to help us, I'll always do that. That's but great. I, we I, can't, I can't think of anything uh, uh, particularly memorable. <laughs> okay, that's better. Nothing outlandish is good, but thank you very much for helping us with that. I'm going to turn next to expert discovery. This is a large topic, but I am going to start you off on what the written expert disclosures look like, and then we'll talk about a case. In terms of written disclosures, the commercial division has changed their point of view over the last 10 years and gone to a more prescriptive statement in Rule 13C, subpart C, of what is required. Um, and this prescription gives each side a very good understanding of who the expert is, what are his or her credentials, what work did they perform, what documents did they review, and what, uh, what other times have they testified over the last four years, and what documents, articles, essays have they published over the last 10. All of those items are in Rule 13 subpart C and need to be disclosed up front. So we tried to get away from trial by ambush, calling an expert to the stand and having the other side have no idea what opinions would be coming out of his or her mouth. Now, I'm going to give you a particular pitch as a commercial division court lover, which is these are the commercial division rules. We actually bind them ourselves here at Simpson. They're awesome to have. You can see they're marked and dog-eared. And it is truly worthwhile looking through these. They're actually somewhat of a fun read for the procedure law geeks among us. And we're probably all guilty of that. Um, but they will give you a very good roadmap for how to approach that particular phase. And rule 13 tells you exactly what needs to be in your expert disclosure report. And the idea again is to foster predictability and provide efficiency in resolving commercial cases. There's another provision of the rule that says the party should liaise with each other 30 days before the close of fact discovery, talk about the schedule, work, try to work it out. Some parties like to do simultaneous exchange of the opening and then simultaneous rebuttal. Others will say plaintiff, you go first, then defendant, you do your opposition and plaintiffs will get a mini rebuttal from their expert. Either way, figure it out, see what you wanna do. There is an outside parameter in rule 13, which is that all expert discovery should be closed four months after the end of fact discovery. And that means your depositions too. And sometimes these can be hard to schedule because the experts are busy. They might be law professors or economists, you name it. And so you have to get onto their schedule early. Um, in terms of the overall cost, each party bears their own costs for experts. And there is an opportunity under one portion of the commercial division rule for each side's experts to actually talk with each other and come up with a list of items that they believe to be true in common and the item that are disputed. That rule is not actually used that often. It was borrowed from the world of arbitration. 
Um, so that's where I'm going to stop off for a moment, check in with Justice Cohen, see if you have any thoughts about the form of expert disclosure or this um, meeting and conferring process among the experts. Some people call it hot tubbing. We don't necessarily love that phrase, but the idea is you put all the experts together and see if they can find areas of agreement and areas of disagreement. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, on the first, I mean, obviously, changing the New York practice was, I think, a great idea. Uh, the, the actual statute provides for very little disclosure about who your experts are and which, what's going to happen. And so the commercial division rules, which are kind of stapled uncomfortably on top of all of that, uh, make it more like the federal rules, you know, with some tweaks. Yeah, it's funny, I've been looking for an opportunity to do the, uh, I think, the uh, the, from the formal uh, translation of hot tubbing was uh, concurrent testimony, um, where you're actually in court. Um, uh, this is the scarier version of this. Instead of at, at the deposition, you actually bring the experts in uh, to court together and they testify at the same time and they can question each other and the judge can question them. And, uh, I, I haven't, um, every time I've raised it to, to lawyers, uh, I've, I've seen the color drain from their <laughs> because it, it, it really does uh, take the control away uh, from, from the lawyers in, in, in managing the questioning. And it's, it's, it's a very much of a high wire act. But I, I've looked for an opportunity to do it because there are a lot of times I think that a conversation would be a much more effective way to deal with expert issues then direct and then cross and then recross and then going to the next expert which is often like six days later in the trial and i don't even remember what the first one said and i god i wish i could ask that witness now something that you just asked about so i'm actively looking for um installing a hot tub in my uh in my courtroom uh, <laughs> without water for this purpose Excellent. Okay, that's good. And I'm glad to know the more formal phrase. We'll use that going forward. The, the last bonus we're going to provide for our, our audience members today is a mini discussion of the case Han versus Chen, H-A-N versus Chen, C-H-E-N. Very interesting case. I'm not actually going to ask Justice Cohn to comment on it because he actually wrote the decision. It's an excellent decision. Um, it involves, among other things, a uh, question about whether an antique furniture was fraudulent or real. But here's the rub. The, the party needed an expert to give that opinion on authenticity and they did not give it under the rules. So I just told you what the rule 13 said and the party proponent didn't come forward, didn't proffer the expert, didn't give the disclosure, didn't give that report where we talked about all the different items and yet wanted to proffer it sort of out of the blue at the summary judgment stage to ward off a summary judgment ruling against the party. Um, that was a problem because it violated the commercial division rules. Justice Cohn wrote an excellent opinion saying it really prejudiced the entire proceeding. The other side wouldn't have a rational capacity to oppose the issue. And as a result, because there was no admissible trial evidence on this issue of authenticity without the expert opinion, summary judgment was indeed granted. Um, I raise it as well because there was a competing opinion from not the commercial division, um, the from and mechanics case, which said, well, the CPLR seems to say you can rebut summary judgment with any item whatsoever. Um, but then, of course, that would set up a tension for the commercial division, which has these very explicit rules about the ordering of expert disclosure. I was very pleased to see that the first department issued an affirmance of Justice Cohen's decision again in Han versus Chen and affirming the enforcement of Rule 13 so that the outcome was the expert opinion proffered on summary judgment was correctly not allowed and the Rule 13 time prescriptions were enforced. Um, so that's, I think, very good for certainty among commercial division practices, practitioners and clients that the rules do have teeth. So with that, um, I think that we have come to the end of our time. I'm not asking Justice Cohn about that, but I am gonna ask him one question more for fun to close us out. We see that awesome picture of a singer in your background on the wall and what looks to be the arm of a guitar. 
Is there anything you want to tell us about that? Well, the picture is of my wife singing, and uh, uh, my wife and I used to be in a band together. Um, but uh, um, but uh, so I practice a little bit to keep my mind uh, 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 sane uh, during uh, <laughs> during the workday. So uh, excellent. I just stash that away somewhere else. But, so. No, since it's in your background, it's now part of your background story, and all litigants coming in will know to use musical references now. Yes. I actually, I, I once wrote a, a brief to a, a judge in Delaware Chancery who was a big rock, big music fan. And I decided to organize the entire brief based on uh, Pink Floyd songs. Um, uh, it was, it, it was a, a, a corporate control thing. So one part was called time, one part was called money, and one section was called wall. Uh, That's awesome. He loved it. I bet. I think we all know which um, Delaware jurist that is. So oh. at some point, well, if it's in the public realm, we'll have to circulate it. That's a great one to see. Well, Justice Cohn, again, thank you so, so much for being the jurist who we got to partner with. It was a total pleasure. Linton, Rachel, thank you as well. And our thanks go out to Justice Maisley, Bob Hague, and everyone organizing this lunchtime lecture series. Cheers, everyone. Take Thank care. you.